Without further ado, we'll get started uh, and um, let's go with Neil. Neil. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, uh, I'm sure there's people coming through, there might be some trouble access. Uh, I'm sure it'll, it'll, it'll ease its way through. So my name is Neil Walk. I'm Head of Architecture. Just a brief introduction. I've been with Conveyor uh, over three years. Uh, I'm responsible for working with a team of architects on our technology strategy moving forward. Um, I've been really working in technology and architecture for about 15 years now, but prior to that, uh, quite a lengthy period of time in engineering. Um, I'm very interested in all things related to cloud or cloud development and speaker on specifically on microservices and service oriented architectures is something I'm highly passionate about. I also don't mind occasionally getting involved in supporting some music events and I used to actually play quite a lot of rugby. I don't know if you'll spot me on that picture, but I used to play with um, some professional rugby in my time before, um, let's just say injury got the better of me. So welcome everybody. I'm quite looking forward to talking to a lot more about Conveyor's technology approach strategy with Martin and David from Amazon. Um, welcome everyone, that's me. So you've got a bit of an insight into my background, and my time with Conveyor. So before we move on, could I just ask, um, can people go on mute, please? We're getting a little bit of feedback on the call. Thank you. So next up is David. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Dave Drelly, and I'm a solutions architect at AWS. Um, I've been at AWS since uh, 2019. Um, before that, um, I worked for BA Systems as an IT consultant, so uh, working with a number of uh, public sector customers on uh, development projects and uh, migrations cloud. Thanks, David. Uh, and then there's me. Um... Martin Denhay, uh, Chief Enterprise Architect at Kaveya. Worked for Kaveya for nearly four years. Been an architect for about 12 years. Uh, and uh, feels like longer, but about 25 years in, in technology in various roles. Um, before Kaveya, I worked um, quite heavily in the public sector. Uh, I, I live in Blackpool, um, which is unusual for some working at Kaveya because uh, mostly uh, Yorkshire or, or, or based down south uh, and in my spare time uh, I like to uh, ride my motorbike and I um, teach and practice uh, a martial art called Aikido. Um, and anyway enough of the boring people presenting let's talk about Kaveya. Um, Kaveya UK well what is Kaveya? Kaveya is uh, for, for those of you who don't know uh, we're a, a general insurer in the UK market. We specialise in commercial, motor, high net worth, property and protection insurance. Um, Covey doesn't sound like a, a very English word. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a French word. We're, we're part of a, a French mutual group called uh, Covey. Um, in Covey UK, um, as, as an entity, we, we service uh, about 2.1 million policyholders, um, and we generate close to about 800 million pound in premiums each year. Uh, and, and we we have a, you know, we we've been operating in the UK market for for quite a while. Cavea formed um, by the um, the acquisition by France of, of of a UK insurer, and then the merger of uh, of some additional UK insurers. That's given us um, quite a um, a good basis in the UK market, sort of three major insurers, which is which brings with it, um, a, you know, a, a wealth of experience. We've got um, between the three companies that make up Cavea UK or made it uh, that form Cavea UK, we've got about 60 plus years trading experience in the UK. Um, we award winning company, we're, we're, we're constantly winning awards, I think quite strongly within our um, down to our customer service ethos. We, we work quite um, quite hard as a company to make sure that we look after our customers well, particularly when it comes to claims. And we hold um, various awards for that, including uh, the coveted uh, service mark uh, distinction from the Institute of Customer Service. So we're, we're, we're quite an established UK insurer that's got a, a really good track record at looking after our customers, particularly when they need us most. When you, when you make an insurance claim, that's when you really need your insurance company. So I'm just going to touch a little bit about 
sort of Kaveya's digital strategy. So within Kaveya Digital, we're we're responsible for all the technology to both supporting all our business and product lines across the areas that Mai just mentioned, but also um, we're focusing on our new um, uh, insurance platform proposition. Um, within within Kaveya, how we how we focused and ob and orientated ourselves towards is to focus on six key areas that is a large part of how we drive innovation and technology and work through all of the individuals within the different departments of different areas as our core objectives, which is all about how we get to a best in class platform, working with providers like Amazon and some others that I'll touch on later, but a, bit, a large part of how we get to a insurance as a service capability. Um, through that, we'll be deriving out the delivery of our affinity partnerships and driving the growth within those product lines for the business. But it's very important to us also to look at how we deliver that great customer experience digitally and focusing on our own people, getting people to be more productive, more transparent, freeing them up to have the right amount of value to our customers. Um, and obviously with with a lot of changes that we've seen with COVID and, and the pandemic, getting that digital workplace right is, is a key important part of getting people to be freed up to have the right value. But we do look at our internally, internally how we work technically and what we do strategically to get people to be in a enriched and robust workplace. Um, that's a large part of that. And then, as as you, you would see, and obviously most agile and, and transformative organisations, it's about continually improving. How do we continually look at and do things better, smarter, quicker, faster to help us get to the right, best in class technology platform that we're, we're aiming for? Um, and these key exigens, these key segments are a large part of our Kaveya digital people objective strategy that we focus on across the across all of our Kaveya digital uh, department and to allow us to get to that goal of a um, new insurance technology platform um, to help us drive our growth. Um, and I just really think it's important that when you're looking at digital transformation or when you're looking at the elements around what we need to do technically, it's also really important to focus on your people strategy, how people are aligned to a common objective, a common goal to help us focus on what we call within Kaveya as our North Star, which is our direction of travel uh, and, and to help us get to become, um, you know, for Kaveya, Kaveya to become the most trusted insurer in the market. Okay, so we've got... Um... Uh, in response to that challenge, we, we we looked at our architecture and and looked at where we were, and we focused on on a, a strategy that's basically three parts. Part one is our core insurance as a service platform. So what we're looking there is to build a, a flexible um, product agnostic platform. So when I say product agnostic, I mean it will it will allow us to do a motor vehicle policy sale, and it will allow us to do a pet insurance claim. Um, so those products, those brands, those journeys, all, all on the same platform. Um, we were actually building that product out and, and we, we're getting to the point where we've we've got part of that in play. And we'll be talking a little bit later on about one of the first things that will go live on that is, is a, a proposition that's coming to the market very shortly. Um, the next thing we need to think about is whilst whilst we're building this, 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 this platform uh, and we're refining this platform, Kaveya has got those those um, you know two million policyholders and and is you know eight hundred million pounds worth of um, of policies sold, and that's that's going on on a daily basis on on some um, systems that have been knocking around the Kaveya estate for for a number of years. We need to make sure that those systems still continue to function, that still continue to uh, support the business, and still continue to allow us to to um, support the customers that 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 are, um, are inhabiting those systems and whose policies and and claims live on those systems. And we need to make sure that we 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 continue to make sure those those systems work and those systems run and deliver value for us. And then the third tranche of this is. As that insurance and service platform is built and becomes more operational and, and becomes more feature rich, we need to start migrating our products from that legacy estate and onto, the, onto that uh, insurance as a service platform. We need to make sure that we do that in, in a uh, considered manner so that we make sure that we protect the customer customers data and, and and the transactions as they as they transfer over, but also that we think about uh, ensuring that we decommission those uh, those legacy systems in the right way. We do that in a considered manner as well. Um, 
and that we we ensure that the that we maintain a, a stable service to our customers and support um our staff who you know who 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 deliver that exceptional customer service whilst we uh, we go through this strategy okay so just getting into a little bit more technology detail um best as is possible to get this into one single page view <laughs> From a technology platform perspective, there's a lot of components here. Within Conveyor, we talk about having 15 core capabilities, 15 key building blocks. And over what has really been the last number of two to three years, we've worked with a number of different providers, of which Amazon, as you'll find out a lot more later, been close to all that, to our, to our cloud strategy and also close to key technology components that we use and work with with Amazon, as well as some other legacy uh, stabilization projects and programs. So Covey's Insurance as a Service Architecture is largely made up of driving that, um, what I call that intermediate or that integrated platform that can support not just direct business in terms of, you know, web, mobile app, but also can support the process of business, business operations and business services. So to do that, we've worked, we've worked quite closely with our, our preferred choice of API gateways. Um, how we can move to an event-based driven design and event-based architecture, working closely with Kafka and other mechanisms, um, working with organizations like Open Text to standardize and stabilize all of our correspondence and documentation that we need to send to our customers, but also starting to look at where I feel is two of the key areas is how we build out a microservice architecture and platform to support not just principles of microservices for claims and for policy, but also for finance and customer, but how we can get the right standardization on that technology that allows squads and uh, teams to take entire ownership of a given component within the architecture and start to unlock the ability to deliver a real-time deployment mechanism and reduce those uh, cycle times so we can start to move to a really fast and robust and clear update to the business so traditionally what we've seen with mine was talking about uh, uh, previously is in a lot of our, a lot of challenges we have with a lot of legacy technology and a lot of legacy, you know, historically from a technology strategy point of view, it can take a number of weeks to release a chain, to release a change. The release train is quite complex and that's largely down to the monolithic nature of how some technologies exist and are coupled together. And you see that traditionally when you look at your end tier technologies where you've got your front, mid, back end sort of technology structures in multiple tiers. In Conveyor, we've focused on more how do we get to a scalable cloud platform foundation that supports an event driven technology uh, working with organizations and technologies like from Amazon and from Kafka and others. But how can we support engineering working on their preferred uh, language of choices around .NET Core, uh, Node.js, how we work in Node to build microservices and then tools that we are working through and evaluate and continually uh, uh, assess is looking at how in the market is what technology stack can help us deliver some key common capabilities in the platform. So Commander is a large part of our work, our work workflow and workflow management and, uh, and business process technology, not just for a specific area like policy, but also for claims, for finance and integration between different business departments. Um, we also, it's also worth emphasizing that we do look at and work with a number of other data science capabilities and a number of predictive analytics capabilities. We do, we do engineering uh, Python, we do engineering in R. We also are working through some um, assessments and valuations of how Kubeflow and how Selden can work together to deliver a predictive analytics platform that allows us to push real time um, AI components into this architecture as part of that data analytics work stream. So within Conveyor Digital, we do have a uh, an area that focuses on data science, the efficiencies in the analytics we can deliver with data science. But we also do work quite closely with um, Amazon on how we will build in our, our, our single data lake platform and how our, our centralizing our data into structured, unstructured, semi-structured formats can support, support both strategic MI for the business across all business lines, but also can support um, data science experimentation, look at the value in our data, how do we look, how do we unlock value and efficiencies in our information that we store around customers, policies, claims, to help get to that 
back to those objectives, that amazing customer experience on a best in class platform. There are a number of other components here that make up a large part of the topology of our insurance as a service technology stack. Um, we have worked heavily in, in engineering and delivery focus on some key 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 deliveries this year. We're starting to see some of the fruits and the benefits of that working on our motor um, microservice architecture. Um, but also it's worth adding that it's not just about business facing application systems. We're also looking at systems that support the contact center and conveyor, the call center. So what is the agent experience going to look like? How can they get, how can we introduce some efficiencies into those people who are dealing with claims calls that they need to respond to and support a good customer experience? So it's a multi-sided capability. Uh, it's about how do we provide a great experience and a best in class platform to our customers um, to support them and their experience, but also to our colleagues and our staff. And over the course of this year, we will be focused on providing that to for all policy services, but then of moving throughout this year, similarly for claims and other areas around integration to back office for finance and for customer services. So over the, we've, we've, we've not just architected and built and, and looked at the technology strategy, we've actually engineered and shipped a large part of this um, with the help of Amazon and other technology partners that you can see um, on this slide. Might drive some good questions on Slido. Happy to talk a little bit more about some areas and specifically. Um, but this is, in essence, our core building blocks for our insurance as a service architecture. Cool. So going back to the architecture strategy, the overall strategy, um, pulled out some key features. Uh, and I think Neil's touched on a lot of these, but just wanted to draw some of them out. And these aren't weighted and they're not in any particular order. But uh, yeah, cloud first. Um, we we recognise that we need to um, leverage the capabilities of cloud and the commoditization of our of infrastructure uh, and AWS are, 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 you know a tremendous partners we're working with in that uh, and um, I think Dave's going to talk to us a little bit later on about the capabilities that we're going to be exploiting through uh, through AWS and how they can help us with this transformation uh, agility um, our architecture is uh, based on uh, microservices. It's agile architecture by design, and it allows us to provide product features in that iterative manner. As, as Neil pointed out, you know, going from uh, months to get features out the door to um, you know to to having daily releases. Um, uh, it, you know, that's that's the goal we're heading for. Data being central, um, bringing you know utilizing our data uh, effectively again. AWS. Uh, providing the uh, the underpinning data lake um, and the technology that our data lake sits on, but that's going to allow us to um, to utilize our data properly, simplify it. The, the amount of data in the, the, the complexity in the legacy estate, it just brings it back, brings it all together and allows us to um, to, to manage that data in an efficient manner. And it allows us to, to support the various um, things that hang off, off data as well, like security pricing, our real time analytics. Um, yeah. That list of uh, vendors, um, I think that's probably quite a familiar list to, to people when they when they looked at the the things wrapped around that diagram. Um, we're constantly looking at best in class. Um, we're not tied to um, we're not tied to a, a particular technology stack, and we we've gone out and some of the technology is open source, some of the technology is, is uh, software that we're buying and commercial software, but we we we've 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 look to go to go to the you know the best in class we, we've we've decided to purchase and procure uh, and, and implement software that's based on it being the the best tools for the job uh, and that's uh, that's helped in a way by the agility of our, our of our architecture and the nature of the design we've gone for means that we can utilize the, the these various components together to give that overall service uh, and lastly but as i say these are not in order reduction of technical debt we still have um, significant technical debt in our legacy estate. Uh, it, you know, it's, at this point, it's mostly technical debt, um, and, and the technology that we have there um, is it, not something that we could easily build upon because of that level of technical debt, and it didn't meet our digital aspirations. So, building that 
that that new insurance platform was something that was absolutely critical to us being successful and, and moving forward and, and we'll reduce that technical debt we we, sh we we're building something that should give us um a, you know a better cost of ownership a better tco going forward and and should give us a, a platform that that allows us to meet our, our digital aspirations uh, and, and and provides that flexibility and agility so that we can um we can support the business that uh and, and enable the business to grow and continue to to be as good as it is in in the delivery of uh, insurance services to our customers. I uh, I like that icon, that graphic around technical debt. <laughs> it's quite often, you know, how many how many times um, I know myself and I'm about da David or Martin that um face this problem that there's a perception that because something is shipped especially from a legacy or historic perspective that it's the simplest route to get change um and that whilst it's a bit humorous it quite often really is the case right um that's the reasons why it takes so long to add a new window to a lot of technology that perhaps not only is it about adding a window? It's about actually looking at the product features and the capabilities you need. Um, you know, insurance market, insure tech certainly, it's it's changing significantly. There's far there is a significant amount of uh, disruption happening in the insurance sector, which is why it's quite exciting. Um, when you look at some of the new market propositions and the cycle of insurance, it's becoming far more. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of change from a regulatory perspective around fair pricing and certain reforms that we need to follow. But customer expectations on insurance companies are changing heavily, and the customer experience aspect, the ability to support them when they actually need help, and be more proactive about understanding their needs and how we do that in a digital way, is really driving new product views and new perceptions of how insurance could evolve. I think one thing that we looked at from a technology strategy point of view is when we started looking at a multitude of different technologies that we have, whether it's actually data center related in terms of the amount of uh, uh, virtualization, the size and the estate of our virtualized environment, with the number of technology solutions we need to maintain and fix and support, and then the ability to move at pace and support them and get them to a place that allows for real time uh, releasable increments of new product features it's clear that we've got quite a lot of technology that we do need to manage and process and look after whether it's storage arrays, whether it's absolute, whether it's focusing on computer and data center strategy, whether it's actually focusing on legacy OS systems. There's a lot of cost and transformational need to modernize. And this is you'll see this a lot more externally in a number of different forms is technical debt is one of the key things that cripples most organizations to get to and move forward at pace. And those organizations that get on top of technology debt and get on top of how we manage and maintain technology debt, I do believe will be the ones that actually make more of a faster track into a into a more uh, internet operating approach around accessibility and providing technology as a service to support customers. And te technical debt is a key part of governance and management within within Kaveya, within Kaveya Digital and the governance of that. And it's more about accepting technical debt. It's more about understanding that you've got it and how you're going to remediate it. So, we know, we do have a lot of duplication and fragile infrastructure that we need to fix and remediate. Not, we don't ignore it, but we do work on it. And we do support it and get that into a rationalized state so we can start to look at standardization of some of these technologies and then start to look at migrating them into our insurance as a service platform. Um, I only really share this to show some, a bit more grounded insight from a technology strategy point of view. We quite often think and focus about new technology, new tools, but we do have to go through the transformation of current or, or, or technology that exists in, in traditional architectures and how we move that at the right pace into a new cloud first approach. Um, so there's just some, some interesting insight around technical debt I wanted to share and how we need to improve it. Okay, I've managed to get this far in the presentation without mentioning bimodal, uh, and I'm not going to mention it here either. If anyone from Gartner's on, please stop sending me the emails. Um, I, I don't subscribe to the to the bimodal model. Um, I, I prefer to think about um, the challenge 
uh, of new and old by talking about passion. We need to be as passionate about existing systems as we are about the development of our future platforms. There's still tremendous value to be um, delivered from Kaveh every day by those systems we refer to as legacy. And we need to ensure that we keep them running and, and we need to look after them. We need to, whilst we build for the future. Uh, and again, this is something that AWS are aware of. AWS have come in uh, and th they've got a certain sympathy uh, and a certain appreciation and affection for the, the systems we refer to as legacy. They're helping us to uh, explore how to support them better, how to maybe re-platform them, how to migrate them, uh, and how to help us ease the transition of our products from from our from our our, our old traditional legacy estate and, and our old traditional legacy hosting solutions into in, into cloud. Uh, they're helping us with discovery um, and 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 how we can really um, keep some of those systems running um, whilst we whilst we get that new one platform for old. Uh, built. I'm just slightly. I'm just thinking I'm slightly aware of time, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of slides and make sure yeah. Dave's got opportunity to pick up his his piece. So, just to touch about touch on the technical debt remediation, what we're doing is working through migration of traffic to a new cloud network capability that's accessible on a number of different providers so we do invest in look at an an internal technology strategy and how we leverage tools like office 365 and workday and so on for that desktop experience but we also work closely with amazon and how can we start to migrate some of our technology estate that i just touched on into um into those environments and then how we can best test and manage the performance of those aspects and move it from our current traditional data centers into a refreshed and renewed platform working with Amazon and the legacy modernization approaches we're working closely with David and their architects um, of allowing us to unlock our ability to not just stabilize and fix our current challenges, but actually to accelerate some of our cloud adoption. Yeah. I think we could probably skip over the next slide, which is 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 just a, a building on that, Neil. Yeah. So if we, yeah, if we, uh, um, yeah. So just to emphasise that part of that is just like two tracks, and our minds on about by model and, and so on. But we've got a legacy modernisation strategy. Where we're going to be moving within our data centre. We're going to be moving to a new hyperconverged infrastructure platform that allows us to build a single Kubernetes plane across both uh, any internal current deployments that we wish to run, but also across an AWS environment. What that allows us to do is start to introduce abstraction from the infrastructure and allows us to put, make our ability to be portable from on-prem to off-prem on different, different environments supported by Amazon or by ourselves on a HCI stack with a single connectivity, uh, cloud-based connectivity to those environments where the insurance as a service will run. So this now gives, from a financial organisational perspective, it supports in terms of risk and compliance, in terms of we can move workloads around if we need to, but also allows us to leverage partnerships and relationships with Amazon and other technology providers should we need to. But working very closely with Amazon as our primary um, uh, cloud partner to support us in doing this. I promise you the last slide from Neil and I before we hand over to David. Um, so this diagram here um, reflects a solution that we've recently implemented with a, a major UK uh, insurer that we're partnered with for an exciting new insurance product, uh, product which is coming soon. So keep your eye out on the market. Uh, this architecture diagram was drawn by one of our chief architects, Kaveya, a chap called Phil Chalk. Phil is, is the standard in Kaveya for neat, clear and beautiful looking diagrams. So I asked him for that diagram and painted it orange and made a mess of it. Sorry, Phil. Um, I did a paint it orange because I'm a, a Blackpool uh, FC fan, um, but really it was to show in that delivery of that that critical project to us just how much um, AWS uh, activity there is and how much we've depended on AWS to to help us build that out. Uh, the partner on which we're building the future and and they're a, a partner which we're, we're already building the future with uh, and, and they're, they're a critical partner to us. So what I'm going to do now is um, hand over to David, who is going to share some details on how AWS can assist with projects that we've got ongoing now and the type of technology transformation that Neil and I have been referring to uh, throughout this first part of the presentation. So David, I'll, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, you're going to seamlessly start and hopefully take over.
Okay. Um, hopefully, you can see my uh, my screen now. Um, yeah, so uh, Martin and Neil have spoken about uh, Kaveh's strategy and their plans. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a bit more about how uh, AWS is supporting Kaveh insurance in their modernization and transformation journey. So first, I'm going to talk about why Kaveh and other organizations like them are moving to AWS and some of the benefits that they see from doing so. Um, I'm then going to move on and talk about a few of the specific areas and projects that uh, Neil and Martin have mentioned and how AWS is supporting those projects. Uh, so for example, with the new um, insurance as a service project, so how the uh, AWS well architected framework um, can help uh, with, with designing and architecting for cloud, um, how Kaveh are looking at VMware Cloud on AWS to support their um, legacy infrastructure and support their desktop BDI platform. Um, and finally, finally, we're going to look at Kaveh's wider migration journey to AWS, uh, some of the approaches that we see customers take um, and, and things to consider for, for organizations on that journey. Um, so before we go on, just to, to make sure everyone's on the same page, so, so what do I mean when, when I talk about the cloud? Um, so we define cloud computing as the on-demand delivery of IT resources via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Um, so instead of buying, owning, and maintaining your own data centers and servers, uh, organizations can now acquire technology such as compute power, storage, databases, and other services on an as-needed basis. So you, you can think of it as similar to how you flip a switch to turn on the lights in your home and the power company sends electricity. Uh, with, with cloud computing, AWS manages and maintains the technology infrastructure in a secure environment, and businesses can then access these resources via the internet to develop and run their applications. Um, so capacity can grow or shrink instantly, and, and businesses only pay for what they use. So, so why do we see customers, um, especially enterprises like Kaveh Insurance, uh, are moving over to AWS? So this slide shows uh, some of the reasons. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, but the first reason that the customers usually uh, look to the cloud is actually cost. Um, so with the on-demand model used for the clouds, uh, you don't have to lay out the capital upfront for servers and data centers. Um, and instead, customers get to pay for it as you consume it so, so as a variable expense. Um, and so if you've ever been involved in provisioning infrastructure on premises, um, so there you, you have to provision infrastructure well in advance. Um, and if you provision on the low side, then if you don't have enough, then you have a customer outage. Um, so instead, you provision for the peak workload, um, and you, you rarely end up sitting there for long. So, so most of the time, you have unused infrastructure that you've paid for just, just sitting around idle. Um, whereas in the cloud, um, you just provision what you need. And if it turns out that you need less, uh, you can give it back to us and stop paying for it. Um, and that variable expense is lower than what virtually any uh, any other company can do on its own because um, because of AWS's scale, um, we can pass on those savings to customers in in lower prices. And and we've lowered our prices 85 times uh, since AWS launched uh, in 2006. Um, and so cost is usually where the where the conversation starts. But the, the number one reason that actually that we see enterprises and governments moving to the cloud um, is the agility and speed uh, with which they can change their customer experience. Um, if you look at most companies' on-premise infrastructure to, to get a new server added, uh, typically we find it takes between 10 to 12 weeks, uh, sometimes longer. Um, and then you have to build all the surrounding infrastructure, software like compute, storage, database, analytics, machine learning, et cetera. Um, whereas in the cloud, um, you can provision thousands of servers in minutes um, and access over 175 services that you can put together and, and use however you want. Um, and that can let sort of Kaveh and our other customers then get from, from an idea to implementation um, several orders of magnitude faster. Um, and another reason that actually we're increasingly seeing factor into customers' migrations to AWS is uh, sustainability. Um, so at AWS, we're committed to running our business in the most environmentally friendly way possible. Um, and our scale allows us to achieve higher resource utilization and energy efficiency than the typical on-premises data center. Um, a recent study in 2019 carried out by 451 Research found that AWS's infrastructure is 3.6 times more energy efficient than the median of, of surveyed enterprise data centers, uh, with more than two thirds of this advantage being due to a more energy efficient server population and higher server utilization. Um, AWS data centers are also more energy efficient than enterprise sites due to sort of comprehensive efficiency programs that touch every part of our facilities. Um, and when they factored in carbon intensity of consumed electricity and renewable energy purchases, um, 451 found that AWS performs the same task with a 88% lower uh, carbon footprint. So 
when organizations start using cloud services and start on the same journey as Kaveya, this is the typical path that we see customers taking. So early in the journey, um, enterprises are in the product phase. Uh, and this is where they're looking to develop brand new business capabilities by taking advantage of cloud native features. Um, here, AWS would be evaluated and vetted on a project by project basis. Um, after experiencing the, the benefits of cloud, uh, customers then look to build a foundation uh, to scale their cloud adoption. Uh, and this includes creating a landing zone, so which is cloud architecture, uh, including account structure, network connectivity, identity management, um, a cloud center of excellence, uh, define an operations model for cloud, um, it's got security and compliance readiness. And then out of the foundation stage, um, AWS becomes a proven choice and is then often used for new projects within the organization. Um, for enterprises with, a, with an estate of legacy applications, we then see them moving to a migration phase. Uh, and this is where they migrate existing applications across, uh, including mission critical applications or, or entire data centers uh, to the cloud as they look to scale their adoption across a growing portion of their IT portfolio. Uh, currently, we see actually very few customers are, are in this migration phase. So, so we, estimates are, are less than 25% of enterprise level workloads that we see have been moved to the cloud. Um, but then once they're migrated across, after migrating these across, the, the modernization phase is where those applications are then updated to start using more modern technologies and start benefiting from new services and features available in the cloud. Um, and then the end stage of the journey, so that the target is the, the reinvention phase. And in the stage with operations in the cloud, uh, customers can, can focus more on reinvention and then really take advantage of the flexibility and capabilities of AWS. Uh, to transform their business, um, as allowing them to, to speed time to market and innovation. So, um, if we if we go back to the beginning of that journey, then so and and start and think about the project and and let's consider the Kaveya's um, insurance as a service project. So, um, as Neil and Martin have mentioned earlier, so this is going to be a key part of the infrastructure. It's a strategic capability, and and going forward, it's it's going to be critical to their their operations. Um, and so when you're considering a critical workload like this, um, actually, no, man, no matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud, you're going to have a number of different areas that you need to consider as part of the design. Um, so you want to make sure that you are building it in an appropriate way. Um, you want to make sure it's secure. Uh, you also want to make sure it's reliable and performance. You want to make sure it's optimized for cost. Uh, and you also want to make sure that the team that's going to be supporting it is, is actually able to, so they can see what's going on, um, understand how it's running, uh, and also make updates and changes to the application safely when they need to. Um, so when designing and building for cloud, though, it, it brings with it a new set of uh, new, new and different set of capabilities that the teams used to developing for on-premises environments probably won't be used to. Um, so, so how do you make sure that you're actually doing things correctly when you start moving to the cloud? Um, so, so when Kaveo were, were starting to build out the insurance as a service uh, project, uh, one of the ways in which we uh, provided support was with the AWS World Architecture Framework. Uh, and this is a framework which we produced, which, which helps cloud architects ensure that they're designing the most secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient infrastructure possible for their applications. Um, and so the, the Well Architected Framework exists to, to drive better outcomes for customers who, who build and operate workloads on the cloud. Um, and it's designed to be a, a mechanism for, for customers like Kaveya on their cloud journey. Um, it allows customers to learn the strategies and best practices for architecting the cloud, um, measure the architecture against best practices using the Well, well Architected tool and uh, Well Architected Framework reviews, um, and then improve those architectures by addressing any high risk issues identified um, using improvement plans, uh, well architected labs, uh, AWS partners, uh, solution architects like myself, uh, and, and other options. Um, and so the, the well-architected framework provides a consistent approach to evaluating architectures uh, and ensures that foundational areas that are often neglected are, are actively thought about. Um, so the well-architected framework uh, provides a set of questions to think about and answer, uh, and design principles which are arranged across five pillars. Um, and those five pillars are uh, operational excellence, so the ability to run and monitor systems to deliver business value and continually improve supporting processes and procedures. Uh, security, uh, so the ability to protect information, systems, and assets while delivering business value through risk assessments and mitigation strategies. Um, reliability, so the ability of system to recover from infrastructure or service failures, uh, dynamically acquire compute resources to meet demands and, and mitigate disruptions such as misconfigurations or, or transient network issues. Um, 
performance issue, uh, sorry, performance efficiency, so the, the fourth one, so um, the ability to use compute resources efficiently to meet system requirements and, and maintain that efficiency as demand changes and technologies evolve. Um, and then cost optimization, so the ability to avoid or, or eliminate um, unneeded cost or, or sort of suboptimal resources. Um, and we find that sort of creating technology solutions is a lot like constructing a physical building. Um, if uh, if the foundation isn't solid, then it can cause structural problems. Um, if you if you neglect the five pillars of, of the security, uh, reliability, performance, efficiency, cost optimization, and operational excellence, um, when when architecting and design, it can become a challenge to to build a system that that delivers functional requirements and meets your expectations. Um, so um, when you incorporate these pillars, then it helps you produce stable and efficient systems, and you can really focus on those functional areas. Um, so for, for the insurance as a service platform, um, so uh, an AWS partner organization uh, ran a well architected review uh, for Kabea last year um, du during the development of the product. Um, and then the, the review that came out of that sort of allowed Kabea to, to identify um, some of the areas uh, to, to focus on it and consider as part of the design um, to going forwards. Um, so moving on to to another example of of a project then um so as uh, the, the, there's a pilot project uh, running at the moment within Kaveya uh, where we're looking at uh, how how VMware cloud on AWS uh, can help them stabilize their virtual desktop infrastructure uh, by providing uh, additional capacity for the, them to use with that solution um and so so um on one of the, the slides earlier uh, it was mentioned that um uh, what one of the uh, areas where Kabea has been facing challenges uh, over the last year uh, is in the area of the, the capacity of, of the on-premises VMware-based uh, VDI solution. Um, and so, so after discussing this with with um, Martin and Neil, uh, we decided to look at VMware Cloud on AWS as a solution for the the uh, the issues which uh, Kabea were seeing there. Um, and so, this was selected for for sort of a variety of different reasons. Um, so, VMware Cloud on AWS is, is the only jointly engineered solution designed to simplify migrating and extending VMware workloads into the AWS cloud. Um, it's sold by VMware uh, and AWS and their respective partner networks, and it's delivered and fully managed by, by VMware and its partner community. Um, and AWS is, is VMware's preferred public cloud partner for all vSphere-based workloads. Um, and what this means uh, is that with, with VMware Cloud on AWS, um, Kaveya, um will be able to, to make use of the massive scalability and, and global presence of the AWS cloud to rapidly, seamlessly, and cost-effectively access the capacity which they need to run and stabilize their virtual desktop infrastructure. Um, and VMware Cloud on AWS uh, allows them to use the same familiar VMware tools, skill sets, and governance uh, that they're already used to um, across both their on-premises and, and cloud environments. And that really helps sort of accelerate, accelerate their adoption and, and business transformation. Um, and then, so looking to the future, when once workloads are, are in VMware Cloud on AWS, then um, I mentioned with, with the, the agility that's possible using cloud services, they'll have some seamless optimized access from those workloads uh, to the over to 200 native AWS services, um, to allow Kaveya to, to modernize their applications, unlock the value of data, uh, and innovate faster with, with cloud native technologies. Um, so uh, just, just aware of time, uh, so, just uh, <laughs> going to all of this, but so for, for Kaveya, um, uh, extending Horizon 7 onto, onto VMware Cloud and AWS will allow them to, to make use of AWS capacity um, while we're still being able to sort of manage uh, on-premises and, and VMware Cloud on AWS deployments uh, together. Um, so looking forward to the future then uh, and, and wider migration to, to the cloud at Kaveya. Um, so we're still early in this process with, with Kaveya. So this, this last section is more general and these, these are not Kaveya specific figures, just want to make that clear, but sort of across hundreds and thousands of customers, we, we see a repeated pattern of economic payback with migration. Um, so often with um, our AWS varieties of, of compute instances and our Nitro architecture approach to offloading network and storage work from the CPU, uh, we find the customers need generally need fewer cores to host their workloads in the cloud, um, allowing them to reduce their licensing costs. Um, and then some other benefits as well. So switching to a cloud-based security model um, often results in fewer security instances. Um, and then 
as um, as Neil and I mentioned, so shifting to uh, both DevOps uh, using modern tools and also to making use of serverless features where more of the operations can be automated. Uh, so moving to event-driven architectures means um, you can see substantial uh, productivity boosts. Um, the, the time to innovation shortens and uh, more, more features can, can be released more quickly. Um, so, so when you're considering a, a migration to AWS, there are um, several different strategies available. There, there isn't one migration strategy that can fit all workloads. Um, and so we see sort of um, customers like they're looking at segmenting their workloads and sort of picking the appropriate migration strategy based on their business needs. So this diagram shows what we call the, the seven R's of migration. Um, and, and these are the different strategies that we see customers taking when looking at migrating to the cloud. Um, and, and there are a number of different tools which are available to help organizations do and plan this. So with Kaveya, um, we're working with uh, Cloudomize, who are an AWS migration competency partner. Um, and they're helping uh, Kaveya sort of assess their current state and plan how to, to move those workloads across. Um, we've already touched on, on one strategy here, um, already in, in sort of the relocate strategy, um, which is the, the method we're looking at for the Horizon project uh, with, with VMware Cloud on AWS. So by, by sharing the common VMware Cloud Foundation-based cloud infrastructure about, across both sort of on-premises data centers and AWS Cloud, um, organizations like Kaveya can simplify and accelerate the migration of their, their mission critical sort of production workloads to the AWS cloud at scale um, without having to convert or re-architect those workloads. Um, so considering the, the other patterns as well, so from, from analyzing over a sort of a thousand migrations, um, we can see clear patterns emerging. Um, so, so first, many customers um, are realizing that they, they have many older applications that, that may not even relate well to their uh, current or future business models. Um, and these can be generally retired. Um, and between 10 and 20% is, is what we normally see here. Um, uh, another area that we see is, is there are now thousands of, of software as a service vendors who didn't exist five, seven years ago. Um, and we've seen a number of sort of on-premise apps generally being uh, replaced by uh, software as a service vendors. And this shifts, uh, sh shrinks down the operational portfolio managed by IT operations. Uh, it's still sort of security, um, still need to look at the security and identity management there, uh, but there's generally less operations costs. Um, and then with the other workloads, you can, decisions can be made to, to lift and shift, um, and, and during a move, look at uh, replatforming the operating system or, or database or, or language to, to reduce costs. Um, and we see more and more customers replatforming from Windows Server to Linux and from Oracle to Postgres or Aurora to reduce their database licensing costs. Um, and then finally, uh, modernizing applications. Um, and what we see here, that the, the key lesson that we've seen is, is that customers should focus on, on modernizing their applications that are real, true uh, differentiators to their, their business first. Um, and we see here that about 20% of applications um, are the ones where, where modernization is appropriate. Um, and then so, yeah, so, so migrating applications and data across to AWS is, is going to help Kaveya gain um, technical flexibility and, and resiliency to, to meet the demands of a changing marketplace and then free up their resources for innovation. Um, and yeah, so I guess I, I haven't seen the slide though. Actually, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, but um, I don't know if we've got any questions there. Um, I've been I've been monitoring it, David. You'd like to know you've, we've done such a fantastic job. I don't think we've had one question. I don't there know. There is if that's one. A good there part. is one question. Oh, <laughs> actually, okay. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, okay, any, yeah, do you want to do that? any silos come up? Um, it's the top question though. Um, <laughs> okay. Let me bet. Uh, and it's one for you, David. Uh, Hi. Um, yeah, so how do you support the challenge of regulated industries like insurance working in a public cloud like AWS? Um, yeah, so this is something that, that we do get asked. Um, so AWS is designed to uh, designed to be secure, um, and we do support the most heavily regulated industries and uh, Sort of those, those industries which have the highest need for security, um, like like regulation industries like banks, insurance, um, 
Uh, also, governments, national security, sort of, we do have a, um, sorry, yeah, we, we do have um, the capabilities here to support this. So in terms of the um, regulations that we see sort of the uh, regulation industry is covering, um, we have teams available to support uh, support those customers and uh, where they do have questions about how to operate securely on AWS. Uh, we have specialists in that area. Um, also, in terms of the AWS certifications that we have as well, so uh, we the, on, on our site, there's a, a dedicated section around compliance um, where you can see the, the wide range of certifications and attestations that we have. So uh, various ISO certifications, uh, SOC um, for the US, uh, things like FedRAMP and uh, the HIPAA, the, the health requirements. Um, so. Yeah, uh, we, we are able to support regulated industries on AWS. Um, and whilst you've got the mic, um, how long does it take to migrate to a TB architecture of AWS? Um, and I'll, I'll be uh, writing that answer down and holding you to it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it really does vary. Um, so it depends what you want to do. I mean, with with some of the technologies like VMware Cloud on AWS, um, it's possible to, to migrate uh, applications across extremely quickly. Um, there's sort of a number of case studies on our um, uh, on our website uh, around customers who've who've migrated in in sort of on the order of weeks uh, for for some workloads. Um, but it's I think it's. <sighs> It's not something which which you can rush, as I've said. Sort of with with migrating applications across, uh, you do need to consider carefully what um, what approach to take. Um, because so if you if you decide to just um, lift and shift applications across and then not not really sort of modernize them afterwards, um, you don't end up seeing some of the benefits that the the cloud can provide. Um, so it's. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's difficult to answer that one. It really does depend on on what what you're talking about moving across. I I think I'd add to that that um, pace is 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 important, but I think it's also got to be considered. Um, and and um, there are, I think you've got to look across your portfolio, uh, and there will be um, low risk items that can be migrated quite quickly and. When we talk to AWS, there are tools that can accelerate that um, and, and make that stuff happen quickly. But depending on what what your what sector you're in and um, uh, how um, critical your data is and how critical your your continuity services, you should really um, you should be looking to do it too fast. You should be looking to do it in a measured, uh, considered, uh, and robust way. Um, so the top question so far is um, from Martin Green. Um, how do you go about maintaining enthusiasm for legacy systems whilst building out a new platform with a number of new modern technologies? Um, and I think Neil and I should have a crack at that one first. Neil, do you want to go? Um, that's a people cultural element to it. Um, first of all, I know I use these terms and I'm guilty of it. I hate using the term legacy, right? Um, yeah, we've got a lot of technology, a lot of techn technical debt, but they are also responsible for processing a huge amount of business volume, of monetary value. But it's also um, it's also a large part, maintaining a large part of our expected and current customer experiences from a technical level. So it's about how do you, how do you maintain the enthusiasm for it? Is it's about how you build a shared understanding of all the technologies you're working with and how, as David alluded to, we support and bring in the right investments into our people. So we've run a number of different, um, David might jump in, we've run a number of different assessments. We've done hackathons with AWS. We've done training events with Amazon in terms of specific areas to focus on for certifications. We've even, you know, from a hack, hack events point of view, we've even put a team together, worked on an event with other external organizations and how we build out certain technology approaches using new technologies <coughs> and um, 
I've even had people in my team going through certifications with the support from Amazon and the right training providers. So it's not just about what we're presenting today. It's about engaging and putting it in the right training programs, the right awareness, the right collaboration environments. And I've been with David uh, from Amazon very closely on those things uh, and his team over the last year. Um, so it's part of how you how you invest in those areas i've lost a slider martin's gone to his desktop um <laughs> but yeah i think that covers it generally you've got to put the right investment yourselves and in, from a leadership perspective into your people um iot and ml as a potential as a major disruptor to the fundamental insurance business model is the current insurance service co cognizant of this future but yeah uh stuart um, so of the, of the, when I walk through the technology stack around the insurance as a service business model, there's a huge, there's a big architectural building block capability called uh, data and predictive analytics. Um, we also work very closely and have, have had access working with David into Amazon's data scientists on tools that Amazon use to help developers and evaluate. Um, we work with in insurance as a service on building machine learning models and we have shipped uh, reinforcement models already uh, to support some elements of claims and um, you you may you may observe in the Kaveh digital um, uh, meet me space uh, a, day, a lead data scientist called Tom Clay did a really good update on how we've been doing that in insurance as a service I think you can still probably access that from the uh, Meet Me page. If you want to go and look at and rerun that recording, you'll get a lot of insight into how data science within our architecture is embedded in the insurance as a service model, end to end, where those initiatives will sit. Just, um, just yeah. conscious of the time, Neil, Dave, Dave G, um, uh, when, yeah. when does the big hook come in and pull us off the stage? I don't see that one. Oh, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't, you, uh, as long as you want to go on for it, really. Okay, well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll try and um, I'll try and go through the remaining questions because obviously there's quite some good questions here. Um, so um, I think, yeah, anonymously, I think heritage is a better term. I don't think it's, I, I don't think, I'm interested in all technologies. Just because it's a technology that we're looking to move to and migrate and replace doesn't mean that it's got some set sense of age to it. Um, personally, I think there's some fantastic technologies that still exist and have existed for some time that having knowledge of will serve you well with other technologies you are using. So yeah, I like that. I like the idea of referring to heritage. It's far more sensitive, sensible. Um, all our technology is important to us. Um, one for David. Uh, how do you balance between feature feature parity across multiple cloud versus unique functionality to differentiate a company trying to avoid vendor locking? From Alex, I think this is more about cloud native and things that are specific to unique to cloud. Do you want to take that yeah. one, David? Yeah, so I mean, around um, around locking, uh, it's understandable that you, you'd ask a question. So, um, if you look at how customers have been locked in with database providers for a number of years, um, you can sort of understand the, the concerns there. So, the proprietary offerings that we see there are normally expensive with with sort of punitive licensing and auditing. Um, but if you look at the way that we we build our services, um, they're built on a lot of open standards. So things like SQL, uh, Linux, and Zen. Um, and we also provide uh, a number of uh, migration tools um, to allow customers to, to easily move premises from on-premises to AWS, uh, but also to, to move resources back um, on-premise if they if they choose to do so. Um, and it's around sort of balancing between feature parity across multi-cloud versus unique functionality. So this is... Um, uh, and yeah, this is a challenge that we see um, customers who who have a multi-cloud uh, strategy um, sometimes running into. So um, what what we usually find is that sort of when customers do look at sort of a, a full sort of multi-cloud approach where it's, so it's balanced across um, different places, um, we actually find sort of most customers there do uh, end up predominantly picking one um, provider, uh, and there's a few different reasons for that. And you, you sort of touched on one already, which is um, when you're looking at sort of splitting across multiple providers, it, it does force you to standardize on the lowest common denominator. Um, and the the different platforms are sort of in widely different spots at the moment. So um, at AWS, we have much more functionality than anybody else. Um, we've got a, a much larger, much more mature community of service providers, um, developers, 
software solutions and system integrators um, and a much more uh, mature platform. Um, also, it's uh, it's a big transition to go from, from on-premises to cloud. Um, if you force teams to, to make that transition and then have to sort of learn uh, to be sort of fluent in multiple different cloud platforms, um, it's, it, yeah, it, it can be tough um, and uh, it does end up using quite a lot of resources. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so we do see that the vast majority of, of customers um, usually pick uh, one infrastructure provider. Um, for, for those who, who are worried about uh, getting locked in, as you say, or, or wanting to make sure that if something goes sideways and they have the ability to switch, then uh, they do sort of run a small percentage of their workloads with a second provider, um, just so that to, to make sure that they know they can do it uh, and they have experience and they've built that relationship. And, and also for comparison purposes, um, and, and the mindset that we have at AWS is that we have to earn our customers' business um, uh, every hour, every day, um, uh, every year. Um, uh, and we've been fortunate in sort of uh, since in the start that the very few customers have chosen to to leave us um, because of our operational performance, um, security, the the breadth and depth of our services, pace of innovation, and and our customer focused approach. Um, cheers, Dave. So the last last one uh, um, is a good question. Um, does Amazon move into the insurance market cause competition issues with insurance? I think this is not necessarily a question specific to Amazon. Uh, competition in any business market exists. Uh, technology, we run a lot of technology. Um, we've got the same competition challenges with our current technologies. Um, you, you the, the concepts of partnering with organisations to accelerate you and help you means you logically, you know, work with a given uh, area, given organisation. Um, and also, it's important to look at working with organizations to the point of technically are we are we strategically aligned and work together in the right values the right approach the right ethos from a culture not just from a technology perspective um mm -hmm. vendor locking exists in any any technology strategy um and we also work openly with our with, with david and team and around you know, should we as he was mentioned if should we need to pivot move a different way we can do so uh, so it's about driving that openness yeah. sorry david and and about that as well. So, um, so if you if you compare it to, to the retail market, so um, and some of the, the other areas where Amazon operates, so so most of Amazon's consumer competitors uh, use AWS. Um, so, for example, Netflix and Hulu. Uh, if you look at sort of the Prime Video, um, and the vast majority of uh, our retail competitors uh, use AWS as well. Um, most we don't have permission to, to reference, uh, but sort of on, on our sites, uh, we do have sort of a list of retail competitors. So in terms of uh, the, the insurance side, it, it would be, be treated just the same. Um, and so that we, we want any company to, to be able to use our infrastructure and build uh, and run their business. Um, so the, the Amazon com consumer business, so it's, it's important to understand sort of as, as far as AWS is concerned, the Amazon consumer business is a, a very important external customer to us, but they are treated like any other external customer. Um, so. Okay, I mean, slightly, slightly aware of time and, and um, I'm sure there's lots of, um, it's good to see some questions coming in. Um, uh, uh, it's important to be open about sharing what you're doing. I think it drives engagement, it drives feedback, drives uh, a sense of inclusion. Um, it's good to get exposure to some of the things we're doing. It's good to get people to get help shape and advise us alternatively. It's all positive by way of provide, driving out an open and transparent approach to how we're going about things. And it also helps community in sharing ideas, best practices. Uh, I'm, I'm from my role within, I think David will advocate the same thing. It's a large part of what we do. Um, and it is important to get as much engagement in, externally, internally, and everything that we're trying to do. So, because we want to get it right, not because we need to keep it, you know, relatively private. Um, so, I'm, I'm more than hoping to be contacted about practices best practices alternative ways forward continually how we can continually evolve and continually improve which goes back to those objectives i talked about um previously so it's a good question there's no other agenda other than a fact driving the best experience and driving the the the, the, the best likelihood uh, best outcome we'd like but also collaborating openly 
um, I think it's a good, positive thing to do. The only thing I'd add to that is um, whilst you know we we sort of labelled, um, we outlined the position of Cavea uh, at the start and the challenges that we're facing. Um, I've faced these challenges in other places that I've worked before. I, I know that other companies um, uh, uh, face challenges based on, um, uh, you know, on, on, on a sprawling heritage estate and um, the the challenges of uh, bringing, um, uh, you know, uh, acquiring other companies and bringing them into the fold and what that does to, to your overall application state and your infrastructure. Uh, and and really, you know, part of these events is to is to um, share what we do at Cavea. Um, people might take something away from it. They might, uh, as Neil said, they they might you might find something in it that you you found useful. You might you might see something out there and think, um, why are they taking that approach? I'm not sure. You can reach out to to the presenters, um, contact us. We're, we're you know we've all been referenced on LinkedIn. You can you can contact us and, uh, and and talk to us about how you might want to do something differently or 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 ask us questions that might be then applicable to what you what the challenges you face in your company. We're you know we're we're, we're all in this to to make uh, make digital and make IT a, a, a better place. Like the sentiment, Martin. Um, okay, I think that was the, that was the last question, and it's great to get some collaboration going, and um, it's great to see some really good questions. I hope uh, just from me, it was appreciated. You got to see a lot more insight. I'm sure we'll be doing more in the future. Give you more updates on how we're going. More than happy to support the community and the and the talk uh, the talk digital meets. Just say personally, a big thanks to David. I know me and Mike took up a little bit of time, but thanks very much for coming and joining along with us uh, and talking about everything we've been going through over the last year or so. Uh, do appreciate it. Um, and there's no other questions. Uh, if anyone else, the presenters, Martin and David, anything to add, um, we'll do and bring it to an end. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for, for coming today. Uh, I'd echo that, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Cheer Thanks very much, David. And thanks, everyone. Uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Have a great evening and uh, look after yourselves and take care.